tell you what, it's not easy being a rugby league player. Okay. It's hard work. Like what they get put through preseason is really, really hard on your body. Um, and if it was easy, a lot of people would be doing it. Let's face it, there's a number of people trying to crack um, these sports and it's hard. Um, so you need to sacrifice, be willing to put your body on the line. G'day, Graham. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How you doing? Yeah, going really well, thanks. Uh, finally, we got the internet connection working, so uh, me, yeah. I'm feeling, feeling much better. So I'm really, really looking forward to this uh, this chat today. So how are you feeling after the uh, NRL season with the West Tigers? Uh, well, obviously, um, the results weren't fantastic, so that was quite disappointing, especially where we kind of finished. But for me, it was the uh, first year at the club, um, and I've been out of, out of rugby for a uh, a couple of years or probably three years. So just coming back into the environment um, and doing something competitive again, I really enjoyed it. So re- even though the results weren't great, um, I still enjoyed the process um, and I'm looking forward to trying to refine a few things and coming back next season big, uh, stronger, hopefully some better results. Ah, that's awesome. So what are some highlights for the season um, for you as a coach? Uh, probably just starting there to begin with because um, – Obviously, there's a new new performance team put in place um, to get to know everyone. Um, so being back in that environment, um, the facility we've got at West Tigers now is like unbelievable. It's mm. a brand new uh, center of excellence. So, I mean, it's a world-class facility. Um, I've never worked in like a, a facility like that. The recovery center is amazing. Um, all the gadgets we've got is awesome. Really good um, gym, like all cutting edge stuff. So that was pretty cool to work in an environment like that. Um, Obviously, the couple of wins we had, we beat Penrith, which was pretty big, and and then we put sixty on the Cowboys before they kind of flipped that on us. So, um, yeah, any win we had that year was, <laughs> was pretty good. It was a bit of a highlight. So there wasn't too many of them, but um, I just think being back in, uh, in in footy and back in a team environment was probably the highlight. Yeah. Mm, that's awesome yeah i did see some you know seen some pictures of the new excellent center and it looks yeah. amazing so it's really cool yeah. to see you know clubs putting the money back into facilities like that and then it's going to benefit both the men and the women's team and also the juniors if the juniors get to train in there and um, you're going to see some really good positive results uh moving forward yeah well, that's the plan hopefully um and it's, it seems like a, a lot of clubs now are starting to go down and looking into these facilities as well. I know the Rabbitohs have a, a new one now as well, which is supposed to be really good. Um, the Swans have one now in AFL, which is really good. Um, they, uh, getting fit out by play. So they seem to be growing, getting more of them. So it's pretty cool. Mm, it is cool. And it's you just look to America and you see these high schools and colleges getting, you're just like, damn, why yeah, can't well, we ten, get that? <laughs> 10 years ago, you used to look at that and now we've kind of got one. So like, mm. yeah, it's cool. It changes everything. Like it's a really awesome place to work when you've got like um facility like that mm. but it does show you that you know you need to know, know how to coach and, and utilize the stuff that you got before you get those facilities as well because um you know clubs in, in in the past have gotten really good results by by using a very small room and the bare minimum of qu- equipment as well oh mate i, I uh, did five seasons at newtown jets and if you ever seen that gym i reckon half the equipment was from 1960s um <laughs> like stuff was falling to pieces um limited like the resources I had there was like next to nothing, but like, you know, we still, we always competed and we did quite well there. So and it's mm. still, they're still doing quite well now. Mm. So yeah, a lot of time it's just, just coaching and a lot of time it's the, the, yeah, there's a lot of different things that go into it, obviously. Mm, 100%. Yeah. So when did you decide you wanted to become an SNC coach? Was this always an area of interest for you? Uh, uh that's an interesting question. I'd probably say when I was around 15 years old, um, I was kind of like, I started, was interested in this type of stuff. Maybe even younger, 14, 15. I remember I was like, at the time, I was like trying, playing basketball and I was like jumping off boxes and stuff. I lived on a dairy farm, so I grew up in a dairy farm. <laughs> I was jumping off boxes and that, doing this, like some crazy plyometric workout I found in some hoops magazine. I bought off the internet. Um, and in hindsight, you're looking at it, like there was no like, extensive pliers, nothing. It was straight straight to depth jumps and everything like that. Um, <laughs> but I was doing that because I wanted to dunk back at then. So I was doing that from a young age. I remember I got an AIS book from my mum and dad for Christmas and I was probably about 15 then. So I was kind of going down that route then. Um, and obviously I went to human movement or we sports science my first year. Um, 
I left the farm to go to Perth um, to do university. And around that time, I knew I was, I was kind of going down that path. Um, so probably relatively young, to be honest. Yeah. Mm, no, it's awesome. I I definitely wasn't jumping off boxes and stuff like that. Nah. So it's, it's cool <laughs> to hear people's stories and how they got into to become a strength conditioning coach. And yeah, you just saw that you had that interest from a very young age, which is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I was always, I was always interested in that type of stuff. And like, I was even interested, quite interested in anatomy and um, um, human biology and all that stuff at school as well. So, mm. yeah. So what, so what sports did you play when you were growing up? Uh, I pretty much played most sports, but um, my old man, my dad played a lot of Aussie rules footy, which is a, obviously a dominant sport in um, WA. So I played that to about 14 and then I switched to basketball and I played basketball to about 18. I represented WA at um, under 18 level. And then I switched back to Aussie rules and played like eight grade amateurs back then. And then I also probably swam from when I was like six to 14. I competed in swimming, but probably pre- predominantly bas- basketball and uh, Aussie rules footy back then. Um, that's when I was a kid. Junior. Now, obviously I just, I train a, a ton of Muay Thai now. So um I did a little bit of boxing actually when I was like 14, 15, and then they asked me to fight and then my mum pulled me out. So um she got she got scared. She was worried I was, was gonna get hurt. But uh I'll blame her. I could have been a much better fighter if it wasn't for mum pulling me out when I was 14. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Definitely sounds like yeah. you're you're an all round athlete and uh, we've got some um yeah, and I kind of probably got I kind of um I during my honors year, I started. I did power. I um, studied power development. Wrote a thesis on that, and kind of like my, I started getting a bit more of an interest in like kind of those power related sports. And I interned at Western Force Academy, doing mainly the developmental athletes back then. Um, so I was kind of going down that rugby path because there's a little bit more power, strength orientated. And then um, I lived after I finished my masters and everything i went to london for a few years and when i come back i relocated to sydney because i didn't want to come back to perth because i thought it'd be too too quiet mm. um and then i kind of that's when i kind of fell into rugby league then there was a spot opening there and i kind of yeah i kind of enjoyed working in rugby league from then yeah it's a really good sport to work in because you get the whole mixture of strength power conditioning speed you need everything, everything. And, everything and, and, yeah. and it really challenges you as a coach as well yeah for sure yeah mm. So when it comes to being a strength conditioning coach for rugby league, what is your overall philosophy and approach to coaching? Um, first thing I look at is what are the game demands. Um, so my approach would be, okay, you look at the game demands, look at the athlete, um, and then you know from those game demands, work out what are requirements to be uh, successful at that sport. Um, then I look at the athlete and I kind of look at their age, their, their experience, um, their injury history, what's potentially um, limiting their performance. And from there, I'd probably try and like blend that together to like um, create programs and things like that to try and excel in performance. But like, yeah, for, for something like rugby league, obviously um, you need to be able to move quite well because it's a running based sport, so You need to be efficient in all those types of movement. Um, you need to be, uh, um, be able to run through walls and get hit by guys. So you need to be able to absorb um, forces and create force and, um, and then you need speed, obviously. So you need a mixture of all these different things. So, um, yeah, I guess for my philosophy for a rugby league athlete, it would be something like uh, an athlete that was efficient at moving in all directions, um, can tackle with strength, can run through guys um, quickly and repeat that over and over. Then also be resilient and robust in these, the areas that are needed for the sport. So, that's one of the biggest things, right? So you don't want guys breaking down. So um, when we look at rugby league, you're probably looking at it's a contact sport, so you need to be strong around the neck, the shoulders, but then you need to be injury resilient around soft tissue areas such as your hammies, your your hips, your, your ductors, your calves. Um, so there's a number of things to take into account. But, yeah. Hmm. How has that sort of changed the game demands in your eyes since when you first started working with the, you know, the Newtown Jets to where you mm. are now with um, the West Tigers? Well, the intensity is a lot faster. A lot from from cup to um, from New South Cup to up. Obviously, the, the, the probably it's probably more contact, but there's probably it's probably games a lot faster. And um, I the NRL send out kind of like um, they kind of send out GPS reports from all the different clubs um, every year. And like I just spoke to my sports scientist, our sports scientist the other day, and it looks like 
like the game's getting definitely getting quicker year on year. Um, even this year, like the high, high speed running stuff, it looks like significantly faster than last year. Um, and you can probably see that in the, the way you watch the game, right? The new mm. rule six again and things like that, the way the game is, it's a lot more open. Um, the game's been played quicker, I feel. Um, and it looks like the number so far, I mean, that's not for the whole whole year. It's only up to around 18, I think, but it looks like it's, it's significantly faster than previous years, yeah. Mm. It's just crazy because you already think the game's fast and like how they're getting faster. And um, it just shows you, you know, slight changes in, in the rules and laws of the game is yeah. going to make, uh, you know, impact on that as well. Yeah. And, and also, like, you, if you watch some games, like, um, during a cycle and it's like non stop, non stop, non stop. And that and there might be that cycle for like a number of minutes, but you just know that, like, it, they can't, like someone, something's got to break eventually. And when that break, they do break. And that's kind of when, you get these really high speed meters. Like that's when you see these openings happen and the game's really quick all of a sudden. Um, so it's kind of like malnutrition, two guys just banging away, banging away. And then eventually someone breaks. That's quite often what happens. I mean, that's when you see the speed come through um, because there's, there's uh, obviously a break and then everyone's yeah shooting off. So, um, but yeah, the new rules definitely has made the game quicker, I feel. Mm. What are some sure. targets you're trying to hit with that high speed running meters to prepare for that worst case scenario? Uh in terms of like high sp- sprint meters and that. Mm. Well, you'd, you'd probably argue that it's very hard. Like you, you can look at research into all this, and there's nothing really, really out, like it changes. Um, because you look at there's some stuff out there in soccer, there's some stuff out there in Gaelic football, and it kind of changes. And it's also hard to to tell because like a lot of people use. Um, they get sprinting f- confused in the literature with high speed running, and it just confuses everything. I've, I've gone through all of it. So, to be honest with you, I, I feel like you probably got to look at the athlete, look at the position, and um, that that would um, that would change depending on a num- number of things. So maybe their age, maybe their injury history, and things like that. Um, but obviously, your outside backs and your your, your, uh, um, your wing, like your winger centers, your full back, and that. They're going to be exposed to a lot more high speed running. So, um, if they're not getting that at a training, you probably potentially have to top that up elsewhere. Um, then your middle is probably ain't going to, it's not going to get as much of that high speeds running, but they still need to be exposed to it like weekly, uh, to some degrees because you know, we know it helps making a more resilient hamstring. Um, and then obviously we monitor that throughout the year. So, probably early pre season, you're probably trying to, you're starting at a lower base of speed because you don't want to cook everyone in the first few weeks because even though people say they've done things in the off season, you got to, your worst case scenario is a number of guys haven't done anything or maybe if they haven't been exposed to any high speed running. So maybe you're progressing from, you know, 80% speed in the first week and you're going to 85, 90. And then you're kind of, from there, you're trying to build a bit of a chronic um, um, base of speed type thing. But then you got to take into account, Hey, now we're kind of in specific prep and we're doing a lot more um, open field, um, game scenario, so you might have to pull back on the speed there because they're getting a lot more of that in the actual specific drills, which they might not have got early prep, if that makes sense. Mm. And then when it comes to an in-season type thing and you're trying to basically just managing week to week, okay, who's hit speed here? Cool. They probably don't need it. They can do some technical stuff here. Um, these guys haven't been exposed to this speed for for a week or so. Okay, let's get some, take them on a side. Let's get some flyers here. Let's expose them to this. Obviously, got a GPS guy there having a look. So that's kind of how we manage it, type thing. And, I, and that's across the board. That's how a number of clubs would be doing it. Yeah. yeah. No, it's awesome. And then it also just like on a side note for me, just because I'm a big NFL fan and people have been listening to the podcast and that are like the NFL. It's it's really interesting to, you know, hear all this stuff that we do in Australia and managing all that. And then when you look to the NFL, you know, you see week one, there was a shit ton of injuries and, you yeah. know, Achilles, ACL, all these things yeah. going and hamstrings. You, you just wonder what's going on over there. And because it would be a bit harder because they can't really train the athletes all season long. They all go to their different facilities. and Yeah. Training well, and all that. yeah I mean, obviously injuries are always multifactorial and there's a number of things that could happen, but look, we have a big preseason. Um, and they don't. Mm. Um, some could argue that the preseason, like some probably do argue, players will argue that the preseason is too long. Maybe there's some merit to that, but like they got, depending on you how experienced you are, you got five to six weeks pre uh, before Christmas, and then you've probably got another 
another six weeks post Christmas and you're doing trials, you know? So, um, and you're still training. So you have a number of weeks where we can kind of build them up and do that. Um, it sounds like, I'm not sure what the NFL preseason is. It's nothing like that. Mm, no, um, it's not. Event. Yeah. I've been outside of it. It's like, well, okay, these guys are probably seeing someone privately, but um, sometimes these private guys potentially maybe don't know the demands of the game. You know? mm. um, and there's some, some some private guys there are amazing. Um, like I, I know Michael Dango, I went and visited him at Freak Strength a number of years ago and like, it was cool watching what he did with all his guys. Like he did a lot of extensive uh, plays and all that. So that he built that throughout the, the season, oh, sorry, preseason or off season for them. So that when they come into round one, you know, they had a number of number of reps and from back early, they built on that intensity throughout. So that they slowly exposed them and gave them more stress that when they went into, um, you know, the early preseason that they were okay. They're already adapted to the thing, but I'm sure a lot of, a lot of, um, Private guys aren't necessarily doing that. Hundred mm, um, percent. That's that's not calling out private guys. Yeah. Because I've done a lot of <laughs> private stuff as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. But outside of the attributes you've already talking about today, what are some others? You know, um, attributes required to be successful in rugby league as yeah. sort of a as an SNC coach, but also as a, as a as a player as well. In your eyes, uh, you have to be willing to sacrifice things um, for sure. Let's face it, like. Um, a lot of NRL guys are putting their body on the line every single week. Um, I don't think people really understand um, from an outside point of view, people sitting at home watching the couch. Um, I sometimes scroll through social media and look at comments and people I just don't think actually have any clue. Or, uh, sorry, I rephrase that. I don't think they quite know what the players put their body through. They obviously have a clue about rugby and everything like that. But you'll see quite often you see like comments like people say, hey, why don't they try and do a real job? Hey, I'll tell you what, it's not easy being a rugby league player. Okay. It's mm. hard work. Like what they get put through preseason is really, really hard on your body. Um, and if it was easy, a lot of people would be doing it. Let's face it, there's a number of people trying to crack um, these sports and it's hard. Um, so you need to sacrifice, be willing to put your body on the line. Um, outside of that, you probably, you know, a lot of they're probably sacrificing partying to a degree, all these type of things that a lot of younger guys are doing. I'm sure some of them still do it to a point, but not to the same degree, you know what I mean? All across the whole, I feel like a lot of kids are looking after themselves and, you know, looking after their body. Um, and the same thing for a uh, coach. Like, let's face it, it's not easy breaking into the into the top. you got to, like, I did, I did New South Wales Cup for six seasons. Um, and I'm, you don't get paid you do get paid, but not like a huge amount of money and you sacrifice a lot more hours um, doing it um, rather than getting probably a financial reward. So you're sacrificing that there. So you need to be hardworking. You're probably going to have discipline to agree and you've got to be probably willing to uh, sacrifice certain things for sure. Mm. I, I can see the, you know, there's there's both the same as being a player and as a coach. So you, you, yeah. You're going to have to sacrifice a lot if you want to make it to that next level and you're going to put yourself through some very uncomfortable times, but, you know, in the end run, it's going to be worth it. And, you know, you're, you're striving for something bigger than you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Mm. No, that's awesome. So how can strength conditioning training help rugby league athletes uh, to reach their full potential? Well, the first thing I'd say is strength and conditioning, the main thing it does is it allows you to stay on the field. That would be the number one thing. Like, it allows you to... Um, it gets you, I guess, resilient, robust, and it keeps you on the field so that you can then sh showcase your skill. Um, for example, and what's the rugby league now? It's 27 seat the games, right? Mm. That's crazy. Like, that's, I mean, obviously not playing every game is a number of buys, but 27 rounds, that's a, that's a big, um, it's a long year. Then you add your preseason to that. So it's a lot of training, a lot of time on feet, doing skills and that. And um, I think strength and conditioning holds you in good stead to be able to continue to play throughout that period. Yeah, yeah, it is crazy how long rugby league is. And you compare that to rugby union to a, a certain degree. But I think 
you also got to remember rugby union. Yeah, they only play, I think it's around maybe 15 rounds of Super Rugby, but then go back to club or play international. But it's a long season. So you need to yeah. best prepare yourself. And if you're not doing a consistent strength conditioning program, then just like you said, you're probably not going to be resilient and robust and you're probably going yeah. to get some injuries pop up, which uh, unfortunately sucks. Yeah, and let's face it, the, the, the outputs that have been shown in the field seem to be getting higher and higher. Um, and the only way you can do that is to have some type of strength conditioning program in place because if you didn't do any strength or conditioning, you probably wouldn't last right now. You wouldn't mm. unless you just had that natural, natural ability. But let's face it, guys are developing from a young age through um being exposed to all these types of training, and that's what builds their body over time. Mm. So without that, you it's be very, very hard to get to that level. Hundred percent. I mean, there's How always much- a few. So you go. Oh, sorry. How much time during an ideal week of the preseason uh, or in-season, it's up to you what you want to talk about, um, should athletes spend in the gym, but then also spend out on the field as well? Uh, well, are you talking about like at the professional level or semi-professional level? Or... It's up to you. Let's just say semi-professional level as, you know, there's a lot more athletes trying to make it to the to the big yeah. leagues. Well, it depends on, okay, with their training, they're probably going to have, what, maybe three skill sessions a week, maybe? Yeah, yeah, we can say yeah. that. Yeah, so outside of that, you probably want to try, if you can, get another probably field session by yourself somewhere, potentially, if you have the time. You just got to you just got to try and manage that throughout the uh, week so you're not making it kind of um, putting yourself at risk, uh, injury risk on the field at, uh, at club training. So if you could probably get another little field session, and that could be a little bit of speed, a little bit. Depends on what you're being exposed to, but typically a, a lot of like – Amateur to semi-professional, like that stuff's not always taken care of. Um, outside of that, look, it's really hard. It's actually way, way harder to program for for amateur and semi-professional athletes because a lot of the time the weights programs where it's placed, like in a professional level, like preseason, we'll probably do four days training, right? We're going to do a field session. We're going to do upper body weights or wrestle. Then you're going to do uh, another field session. And then you do your legs. And then you have then you're going to have a day off so you can recover and let your legs recover. And then you'll probably repeat that process to a degree. But when you're at a semi-professional or an amateur level, trying to get those gym programs in, is kind of like, you're just trying to find the space where you can kind of get them in. Because obviously you don't want to be doing legs before you go out in the field. Uh, you don't want to have a massive heavy leg session and train being exposed to high speed meters the next day. So I'd probably say if you can get three days a week weights in, that'd be beneficial, but you just kind of be smart how you place it throughout the week. Um, and that's a tricky thing to do. Obviously, getting upper bodies in is not a not a problem, but you still want to be probably training your legs to some degree twice a week. But where you expose your your, your, um, your lower limb to eccentric work and stuff like that, you just got to be careful because you don't want to um, make it a little bit dangerous the next day if you've got, got some type of on feed activity. So it, it depends, I would say. But I think if you can get preseason three days a week weights, that'd be great. Potentially another field session. Um, depending on how you feel. In season, you're probably looking at two weight sessions. Um, your first one's probably a little bit more uh, force orientated, where your second one's probably a little bit more um, power orientated. So um, your readiness for your game that, that weekend is uh, you're not going to be too fatigued. And you probably always got a, like a good thread of like resiliency and robustness and injury prevention year round. Um, and that can be individualized to, towards the person as well, depending on the nickels that they have. Yeah, mm. no, it's awesome. And what would what was your approach at the Jets in terms of the gym? Were you doing you know upper lower body split? Was it a couple up uh, whole bodies, then an upper body uh, upper body extras, and then how did that change sort of now going um, and programming for the West Tiger stuff as well? Uh was it, I'm trying to remember, it was quite a couple of years ago. It would depend. It was at Newtown? It was different because when I was at Tigers Reserve, which is Magpies, it was different because when I was at Newtown, we did weights before. Okay. And that was the only way they could do it. So it made it really, really tricky. So they're like, we're kind of like, like one, we're doing kind of doing full body. And then when we're doing legs, trying not to cook them in case that the, when I did field after, but then we do some eccentric work on the field after, something like that. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So you, you're trying to do it without, to a degree, to still get like a stimulus, but not. So, if you knew the session was going to be like a sprinting session, the legs would be quite a little bit easier and you do some eccentric work at the end or something like that. So you're kind of, honestly, you're just, you're just trying to pick this. I don't even know how you call that programming. It's just like, mm. 
Does that make sense? It would look if you looked at the program on paper, it'd be way different to like anything else you've done. When I was at the Magpies, it was a lot easier because we always did um um uh, gym post field, so you can have more of a traditional approach to training. Um, and West High, like West NRL, if you're a preseason, if you're doing two days back to back and you have a day off, you're always going to have your upper body on that the first day. Um, and then the second day is going to be a field session followed by a lower body session. So then you give yourself recovery the next next day before you get back on feet. And then you probably have your biggest lower body session that last session of the week. Um, you get a lot of the centric work type in um, because you're going to have a couple of days to recover if you have Saturday, Sunday off. Mm, so, awesome. Yeah. That's yeah. no, a really good insight. And in an ideal week as well, doesn't matter what team it is um, in rugby league, how would you program your field sessions in terms of, you know, hitting your speed metrics for acceleration and then working on your max velocity or doing some small-sided games? How would you sort of plan that out if you had the ideal week for you? To, um, say, it, to say during the preseason as well. Yeah, I mean, you, you don't, like from the initial part of preseason, we don't, well, I don't, some clubs probably are, but, you know, if you're doing small-sided games, they're really small-sided, like really small, small, because you don't want to expose those guys to that chaos straight away. Um, but you probably have – there's a number of different ways you can do it, right? Say you have a four-day training week. Perhaps the first session um, could be like um, like a max velocity or you could have a change in direction of acceleration. It's up to you um, one of those days. So that would be on the Monday and the Thursday. So you, you probably have one of those – Sessions would either be a max velocity or the other one would be a change of direction, acceleration type thing. Um, and then there's typically you're going to get more time on those two two days, but the third and fourth session, you're probably not getting a huge amount of time. It's more of a quick warm up type thing. Um, and in those warm ups, you're probably, you're still thinking about attributes that you can bleed into the warm up because you don't want to waste your warm ups um, and put fluff in there. You still want to get certain things. So, like with my max velocity, I know. I'm always looking at things like what's going to target switching, what's going to target um, projection, what's going to target reactivity. So there's three big things I'm looking for there. Um, uh, then acceleration. So max velocity day, we could be doing different drills for that. You might have some wicket runs, you might have some build-ups, you might have some flies, um, depending on the top where you're at. Then that might be a bit more game-specific as you get into specific prep type thing. So you're probably going for a little bit more Basic stuff, building foundations into something a bit more chaotic towards the back end. So you're having those kind of layers. And that would be the same for your, your um, acceleration, change your direction stuff. It would be a lot of banded work st- to start with, reduce the speeds, um, try and get proper shapes, a little bit more closed chain in nature, your drills, just refining technique. And you're taking that away and it's becoming a little bit more reactive. And then your agility is becoming a lot more open in, in, in place and then your acceleration is probably... Uh, going from resisted to unresisted and um you're kind of bleeding that across the the different different preseason yeah and um and then also like our my prep when we do the group prep and that I, I i'll bleed that into what we're doing on the field that day so we have an individual prep and we'll have a, a, a group prep so the the theme for that day is uh, max velocity um some of that group prep stuff is going to be looking at some of those attributes that are going to be beneficial so that when they come straight on the field, we're nearly just about after a few run throughs, we're nearly like straight into that stuff. So I'm trying to save time that way. Yeah. Mm. No, it's a, it's, it's a great insight and mm. it hits the nail on the head with the warm up as well. Cause I feel like as S and C coaches, you probably take the warm up for granted sometimes and you know, you slowly build into it and then you yeah. start to realize like, Oh, my time's getting cut when I have to do my main stuff. How can I yeah. put all these little things into the session? And like you said, the warm up is a great place for that. Yeah. Well, first of all, you got to try and like build a, um, you really got to, even if you're at amateur level, you're trying to build a culture of guys looking up and doing individual prep. Okay. Yeah. This is a start time, but you should be here 15, 20 minutes before doing all your individual stuff. So that I don't even like calling it a warm up, even though it is, but like you should be ready to go. Like you've done all your stuff, whatever you need to do, work around your injuries or your niggles, um, your basic stuff. Okay. Now we're into like group prep where like, because a lot of the drills that we're doing, they're still going to be intense in nature to get some type of uh, adaptation. So like, we might do some switches. We might do some um, hurdle work. Um, we might be doing some plyos before we roll out into the field type thing. You know, some injury prevention stuff. Um, they've been in the field. You know, we, we're doing into things like dribble bleeds, plant uh, scissor bleeds, all this type of stuff. You know, in, intensive pogos. You're bleeding these things throughout the session. So 
you know, they kind of got to be ready to go when they're doing that. So that's the kind of thing you got to do, try and build that culture that guys are ready to go before they're even out there. And that saves you a lot of time. Otherwise, if you're spending 10 minutes warming up, you've got no time to work on some of these attributes that are really, you probably consider really, really important as a coach. And those things are really important. That's what I consider. I want guys to be fast, be able to move well. So to be able to get the full allotment of time, I'll make sure guys are prepared before they get on there. Mm. Was that always the culture of working with the Jets and then also the Magpies as well? Or did you have uh, to try and bring that in? But then, yeah, you know, it's, it's harder, a lot harder because, you know, unfortunately at a semi-professional level, guys can be coming in at different times and that always makes it more difficult. Um, but you try and do it as best as you can. Yeah, you know, mm. that's 100%. Yeah. So wrestling training is now a regular part of the rugby league program and it's something mm. pretty unique to rugby league. Can you talk about wrestling training for rugby league, rugby league athletes and the importance and how it fits into the program and anything else you can think of as well? Yeah, I mean, like... I think each club probably has different um, ways that they'd, they'd put the wrestling in. Like, I'd, I'd probably argue, like, four or five years ago, it was even bigger. Like, it got really big, right? And um, pe- people doing, like, a lot of wrestling-specific things. Um, but, I mean, a lot of that will happen probably early prep to a degree. Um, and then you want to get more specific and more make it more um, realistic to rugby league and... Um, what actually occurs in the field. Um, I mean, we probably, as a club, we probably made it a lot more specific this year rather than just pure out wrestling. Like, you're always going to have general drills that are kind of wrestling-specific drills, but I think it's important that you always bring it back towards the sport. Whereas, I think in the past, you would have seen a lot of people just do, like, really, really just, like... I'm just, I'm just saying this from afar, but maybe because I wasn't necessarily involved, but I heard a lot of clubs just doing a lot of wrestling, wrestling stuff, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But I think it's important, okay, we that's not the sport on the field. How do you make that more specific to the sport? And I think that's probably more important. So you, you still have those things in there and that can probably, but you still want to bleed that into uh, what occurs in the field, you know, because it's still very tactical and technical. You want guys double banging at the same time. You want the person coming down chopping and things like that. Um, involves a lot of talk and communication and, and technique and certain things that just general wrestling drills are not going to cover, if that mm. makes sense. So no, it does. Yeah, so I think it's important. Like, you might put some of those things in early prep to kind of build them up for that later on, but I think it's really important that you've got that specificity in terms of um, how you, you're, you're tackling and you're getting that contact in as well. When you are putting into your early prep, are you doing that in, in the gym or are you doing it before they're doing some contact or after contact? I, 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 I never took wrestling at all. Okay. Um, we have our, our def- defensive coach was doing that. So um, we did, they did them in separate sessions. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. when they, so, so on that day, you know, they're going to be doing some wrestling and some heavy contact. How do you best mm. prepare the athletes to be able to, to do that? Is that part of the warm up or do you get them? you know, just before they do some contact stuff to warm them up even more, or is that just full to the defensive coach? Yeah, so they basically we're doing our wrestling sessions post-lunch, um, after the field. So they just start off with, like, some lower-intensity drills and build up into it. Yeah. Awesome. Mm. Yeah. But which would be different, like, if you did it on, like, some some guys at semi-professional level probably doing some degree of it in the, on the field. And mm. obviously you, you probably need to go through your different things of pummeling and all that stuff and mm. – to prepare for it but um yeah that's one thing at a professional level you got a lot more time to kind of get through that stuff and make sure that everyone's ready to go 100 mm, yeah. percent. i guess if you want to work on your wrestling as a semi and amateur just make sure you, you sprinkle into, into the program where you can and just yeah make sure like, you warm up properly as well yeah and also like it's probably a pretty cool thing to do in your off season right mm. um like i always feel like off season things like a bit of speed work if you can find it somewhere bit of um wrestling some guys into their bjj now um all those type of things i think are pretty cool with boxing even i, I just think like working on a new skill in the off season is always something cool and gives you a little bit of a break um and learning a new skill that might have some carryover um sometimes but it also gives your body a break from mm. you know, that, that same sport but uh yeah it's, it's always hard trying to fit those things in even though it's big but like trying to slide that into like a, a amateur semi-professional level because um you're always trying to work out like what's going to give me the biggest bang for my buck um and but how can i also get these other things that are important to try and 
enhanced performance. So it's kind of that juggling act. Hi, everyone. We just want to take a quick break from this episode. We hope you're enjoying this episode so far and all the content we have produced. We appreciate all the support from our listeners and followers so far. If you haven't already, sign up to Elite Rugby SNC blog today. You'll find our website link in our bio below. Remember to like, subscribe, and share Elite Rugby SNC on all social media platforms to all your family and friends. Thanks again for all your support. And now back to the episode. Hundred mm, yeah. percent. But yeah, I love that that point you make in the off season, going out and do something else and a different skill, different sport, or it could just be a different hobby or something like that, just to take your mind away from uh, yeah. From- rugby or rug, rugby league because it like 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 we said it's such a long season so you need, you yeah, need to take and some time away with that being said like it's always important just to probably like you know four weeks out from season start just starting to get your running volume up and starting to build that back up so that when you come back you're kind of ready to go um but yeah initially you might have a few weeks off in the off season rest your body but then things like that i think it's pretty cool um and a lot, a lot of guys now like when you they don't, a lot of guys don't like having time off. You think you do, and then you have three days off, and then they're, they're like, what am I doing? I need to do something. So that, that could be the time to do that, yeah. Yeah, 100%. So what do you think is often neglected and forgotten about in a rugby league um, athlete strength, strength and conditioning program? Um, I think it's getting better again now. I think for a, a little while, everyone just went down that route of just trying to chase numbers, um, and people got – really like oh what's your squat numbers what's your bench numbers um i think people have kind of gone away from that now um but i think i think what's important is like okay what when you look at like what's going to stop you from playing on the field it's okay are you can you withstand the forces so you need to be able to you know um have enough force do you have enough um body armor um, and then are you resilient or robust in the key areas that either you've had a uh, you've been injured before or there's um, a high incident of injuries occurring in that sport? So that's when you're looking at your hammies, your ductus, your groins, your shoulders, your scaps, your necks, all that type of things. Um, and you're probably sprinkling that stuff around. You just your, strength, your power and your strength work, right? Mm. Um, it's having a good, good balance in all your, all your key movements. Um, so. I'm sure I like to think other people are all doing that, but yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> what are some things you like to do for the adductor region? Um, Cause this might be an area that some coaches and athletes just probably just don't program for. Uh, like you can just, you can do stuff, start, start with basic from the very bottom. You can start with things like groin squeezes and things like that. From there, you can go to short lever Copenhagen. You can get a longer lever Copenhagen's and you can maybe dynamic stuff like that. Then you can start doing lateral lunges, things like that. Um, yeah, anything in that frontal plane um, to, to a degree, like any single leg stuff, probably going to work the adductors as well. Um, split squat variations, um, single leg squat variations and all that. Um, don't make everything bilateral. Uh, get only one leg a bit. Um, and then to be fair, like things like change of direction and um, lateral plyos and all that are going to work the adductors to some degree. But like, yeah, if you're working shuffle patterns and all that type of stuff, um, you can even do that stuff loaded as well. Um, and trying to nail those positions, they're going to train your adductors to some degree. But yeah, stuff like that for sure. Um, big, big. I think I think thing, big thing this year is um, that's happening in rugby league. Is uh, there's a number of calf injuries. Um, so that's because the people don't realise that the, the, the soleus is probably the main propulsive muscle that occurs across most um, running loads. Up to seven meters a second, the soleus does a, a lot, a ton of work, ton of work. Um, I don't think a lot of people know that. So I think the lower limb, the calf is like your calf raises, your bent knee, calf raises, that stuff's really important to some degree, have a capacity at the start and building strength and that coincide with maybe a plyometric program. It doesn't have to be um, huge volume, but like you're bleeding that in um, from day one with all, all that um, calf work as well, because you've probably seen all the numbers like calf injuries are going through the roof this, this season. Um, and that's because uh, this is what I think. I think it's because you know your soleus is maximally activated around seven meters per second. Um, and then after that, the hemis kicks in a bit. But uh, the speed of the game around that area with all those new rules we was talking about is kind of pushing that 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 speed zone there. So um, there's no such thing as magical muscles, but there's neglected muscles, and um, that quite often. 
your little calves and things like that people don't think about. Mm, 100%. Is there a certain area that or a certain ground that has been exposed to more calf injuries? Because that, that's just popping up on my head because I remember this yeah, year. Yeah, I'm not sure. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for I'm not, the... I, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I, that's one thing that NFL are talking about, right? They're all complaining mm. about the turf and they say turf creates more injuries and things like that. I think with surfaces, that um, playing surface is quite interesting. Like, um, you know, when, when you go from a hard surface to a soft surface and things like that, it's, it's you've got to be careful. This is a big change in what's happening to the tissues. Um, so you always got to take that into account, um, things like that. Yeah, I, yeah. I experienced it this year with my Aussie Rules team. We went from just training up the road to one oval, which was in really good condition, and then we just went 200 metres down the road to an oval that was a bit harder. And, you know, yeah. the athletes, uh, a, a few soleuses came up, just um, a bit of soreness, and we just like, oh, okay, we just need to drop that load down a little bit. And, yeah. thank, and thankfully nothing occurred from it afterwards, but just yeah. – Going 200 meters down the road to a different service, which you yeah. think it would be pretty similar, it wasn't. It was completely different. Yeah, you're exactly right. You got to you kind of got to drop that volume initially again a little bit because it can just yeah, it can your body's an amazing thing and it realizes doesn't hasn't adapted to these specific surfaces yet, and you might cause all type of little micro um, trauma to the tissues and that, and uh, you know very easy to have a soft tissue injury that way. Mm. I think it was my. Um, one of the researchers and lecturers at uni, he was telling me, or it might have been Ben, was telling me in South Africa in ooh, one of the stadiums, they had multiple different patches of grass and they were getting multiple different injuries in that in those areas as well. Oh, so right. Right. it's it's fascinating how the turf can just play havoc on certain parts of your body. And um, if you did have that as your surface and your playing ground, just that's a big risk factor right there. It's just the different types of grass that you have. Yeah, and like, like how often do you know people when they change their footwork and they go do the exact same run, and mm. all of a sudden they, they they feel sore or something's irritated straight away, it's just from changing this, their footwork footwear, you know. Mm. Um, so it's similar to changing you know surface of the ground. It's just the body's not adap- adap- um, adapted to it yet, so you'd be careful. Mm. Yeah, hundred percent. So right. working in the rehab area for the West Tigers, if you could provide athletes with a few points of advice when it comes to rehab, what comes to mind? With rehab, um, probably be diligent. Um, try and stay positive. Um, outside of training, look after your body. Um, because a lot of those, all these little things add up and can help with the healing process. So like um, whenever you're doing – uh, things like rehab, you want to have like a time on ticking off certain things. Um, and I think it's important that they're, they're like uh, kind of like measures of performance some type. So you got you can have short-term goals depending on how long the injury is. But like, okay, you know, this, you know, you might have a target you want to get to and you tick that off and okay, you might have your eyes on the prize for something different. So you, that way you're staying positive and you've got something to tick off and you've got mini goals um, where you can interact guys in with the full squad so they're not always left alone. So, um, so you can interact with everyone and um, enjoy the process as well. Um, and spend it on time and like, okay, well, you can't, might not be able to do this or something like that, but you might have a neglected area or something else that you've never worked on in the past. This is a time where we can bring that up. Um, so you, you, you're giving other little goals and things like that. Um, so yeah, you just try and make it a positive experience and um, keep your eyes on the prize and yeah, try and stay positive. I think that's yeah, the big it's, thing. Yeah, it's probably the hardest thing as well, trying to get players out of that little slump that they've um, come into because they got injured and it's acceptable, you know? It sucks getting injured and we don't want yeah. you here. We want you to get back to the main group. So I think all those points you just um, said are great ways to make the experience more positive and get them back there uh, pretty quickly yeah. as well. Yeah, and injury is just a part of sport. So, you know, unfortunately, some people think they have the answers and you know, none of the athletes get injured, but uh, you're, you're going to be dealing with injuries all the time in this, in this game. Yeah, hundred percent. So, when you do get some spare time during the week, what do you like to get up to? Me, uh, mate. At the moment, I just I'm training because I'm in the off season. I'm training about three, four hours a day in Muay Thai. Um, I actually fly to Thailand on Wednesday. Um, okay. So, my wife's coming with me for ten days, but then she's taking off, so I've got plenty of time by myself. I might even have a, another fight over there. I see. So. Even though I'm 40 now, so I really enjoy training, um, especially like combat because there's always something new to learn. And as a coach, I find I it's making me a better coach because learning all the processes along the way. Uh, I always I enjoy studying, um, going down different rabbit holes. The last few days we've been going down a heap of hamstring research. 
Um, but that ch- that comes and goes. I watch a bit of TV. I um, love a beer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much it, mate. So, yeah. No, that's awesome. What do you like to watch on TV at the moment? At the moment, what have I been watching? Um, I just finished Top Boy. Okay. You know Top Boy or not? No. No. It's like a, like London Gangsters type thing because I lived in oh, London, yeah. for, London for three years. So the third season came out. I watched like six episodes. I watched in two days. Um, so I hammered that. What else am I watching? Watching a little bit of that. Uh, what's that 50 Cent show? The one that um, Tommy. Uh, Force, is it? Yeah, the Tommy one. I watched a little bit of that. Mm. Um, but yeah, I'm not. I watch bits and pieces and sometimes I just scan through my social media a little bit. But mm. yeah, I try and no. stay away from. I'm training most nights. I don't get home from training till probably 7.30, 8-ish, so cuts away a lot of TV time. Mm, 100%. Yeah. Last night we uh, put on the, the – the is it the Wrexham? Wrexham? The uh, d- documentary on Disney. I don't, um, it's just with Ryan oh, Reynolds okay. um, who bought the, the the football team over in – Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. In, in, in the UK, that's – like we, I, I just watched the first season and uh, the first episode of the second season. Got to go back and yeah. watch the first season, but that's really cool. Like if you're looking for something else and yeah, just, just like, have the, the the positive impacts of um what sport some, can do. That's a good there's one. There's some there's some awesome Netflix type like you know the Last Dance and all that stuff. Mm. And, and um, what well, the Swamp one the other day, the Swamp, the NFL. There's one. also the the playbook. I think it is as well, which goes to different coaches. It was back um in 2020 or 2019 as well. It goes to like a soccer coach, goes to the NBA, goes to something else as well. That's oh, okay. another good one. Mm. I'll have to check it out. Yeah. Mm. Sweet. All right, moving to the last part of the podcast. So this yeah. one's just random questions, short and yeah, short sure. or quick answers. Um, it's up to you if you can do it in a short answer. But outside of rugby league and combat sports, what sports do you like to keep up and watch the date with? Uh. I'm pretty bad. Like I watch a lot of combat, as you said, um, a lot of UFC, um, league, probably a bit of Aussie rules here and there. Um, occasionally watch a bit of NFL basketball, but I wouldn't. When you work in sport, I kind of don't watch a whole heap of it, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Need, need some time to to have a break from sport. Yeah. 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 So. Mm. So, which players are due for a breakout year next year um, in the NRL uh, for for the West Tigers? Listen, they got a number of kids coming through the ranks. Um, like this year, had I look at Dream Buller, like he was a trainer trialist, and he was our best. Pl- he was our, voted our best player of the, of the season, now. and so like he was a trainer trialist to start of the year. Then we have a number of a number of those kids that are twenty. Um, like that talent, the silver seven. He went from SG ball to fleet to reserve grade to played a couple of games at NRL when Appy broke his jaw. So we got. We got. Oh, I think we've got a heap of kids coming through. Um, so I, I'd probably say we've got five, six, seven guys that are they're breaking through the ranks. Um, they've come through the system and going to look good, going to be a good in the future. So, yeah. yeah, exciting times ahead. So, which song would you pick to sing at a karaoke bar? Which song? Um, that's a good question. Maybe something like "Gangsters Paradise." I don't know. <laughs> it's, that's easy. Yeah, easy. So what is a common misconception you hear in rugby league that is just wrong? Probably what I've been to before, like um, probably down that route when people say, oh, you know, come and do another job if you think that's think that's hard. Well, I, I think these guys have it pretty hard. <laughs> if you see what they put their body through, you probably realise it's pretty tough. Um, mm. And I think, um, I think the general public probably don't quite know how hard these guys train. Um, yeah. and what they put their body through, um, how broken they can be the back end of the end of year, um, you know. So I think that's probably one of the big, the big things. And yeah. also, like, I think guys are a lot a lot more intelligent than most people realize as well. You know, um, yeah. Because sometimes you get this um, with, with like any type of contact sport, people think, oh, they have this general overview of these guys, you know, but they're a lot more intelligent. Some are. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Top three movies of all time. Uh number one, good gladiator. Uh number two, I like anything with Denzel Washington in it. Mm. Um that yeah, that can be two and three. Maybe have you, yeah. have you seen the, 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 the latest equalizer movie yet? Mate, it's on the it's on the hit list. Mm. So um, have you seen it? No, nah, not yet. I'm keen to see nah, it. Though. Yeah, have I'm you... keen to see that. Mm. I, like, I like his other one, like Man on Fire, Training Day. 
all those movies are are kind of cool. Yeah, mm, I love it. Hundred percent. What has been a big game changing moment in your coaching career that sort of stands out? Oh, big games. I'm not really sure. I mean, I think I did a lot of hard yards. Like I did six seasons of cup. So finally being in a, in a full time system probably be the highlight for me. Um, but like, I mean, I'd, I'd kind of given up to be honest with you. I was in, I moved to Thailand. I was over there for five months. I probably was going to stay there. Um, and I got the call to come through. So it's uh, yeah, probably just been back in the system and it was probably the highlight for me. Yeah. Mm. So if you could have a gigantic billboard anywhere um, saying anything um, and that message was getting out to, you know, millions of billions of people, what would you um, have written on it and why? Hmm. Right. I'd say never give up. That sounds a bit cheesy, but maybe, yeah, I don't know. Be something about being... Strong and tough, not giving up. Some, some, some type of thing. I got to think about that. Mm. That'll be along those lines. Hundred mm, yeah. percent. Top three books that everyone should read. Is there anything that comes to mind? In terms of like any it genre, be, it can be P, uh, like a p- personal development. Could be fantasy. Could be crime. You know, anything. I used to read a ton of books when I was a kid. It's funny. I read all the Game of Thrones when I was in high school, and I'm forty now, so I was twenty years ahead of the game there. Um, <laughs> But the yeah, I thought those books were pretty cool in terms of sports performance stuff. I like all this old Soviet stuff. I think it's cool. They're kind of ahead of the game. Um, I feel like a lot of people talk about transferring that now, and they've got really no idea. So you could go through and read all the Bondarchuk stuff, Berkashansky, and stuff like that. Um, any of those, yeah, those books are pretty cool. Um, sports performance, yeah, those those Soviet books. James Smith, uh, the Thinker Smith. Yeah, some pretty cool like, governing dynamics, coaching, all that stuff was pretty pretty good. Fergus Connolly, game changer. So along those lines, I'd probably say those all those type of books. And then, yeah, that's probably it. Easy. And last yeah. one, what's a highlight that stands out in your coaching career so far? Highlight. Yeah, probably just, I don't know. So I never really think about this stuff to be honest. Like, I hope there's I hope the highlights are coming to be honest. Um, yeah, so I'll skip that one. Mm, that's all good. So, <laughs> that's pretty much all the questions got today. Who should be my next yeah. guest on the podcast? Is there any uh, athletes or coaches that should jump on for a chat? It's funny because I, I spoke to Nathan Kyle yesterday. He said that you, um, you already had him. Yep, I did. Um, so, he rang me yesterday. So, I'm trying to think now. Who does it have to be rugby related? No, it can be uh, anything with um, coaching or athletes or anything like that. Coaching athletes. The guy I work with, Alex Clark, he'd be good to have on because he's he's worked for a number of sport, sports. He's been in Brisbane Lions, been Cronulla Sharks, been there, been at Hawthorne as well. So you can get him on. Um, I'm trying to think outside of where I work. Yeah, you get my buddy Kieran, on, but you might have to <laughs> might not be able to PG rating with him on there. <laughs> That's all good to say. He's, the... he's not doing sport now, he's doing more business stuff. So Okay. Yeah. That's easy done. So where can listeners find you on social media if they want to reach out? Yeah, Instagram, I'm Graham underscore Morris. Um, I've got a Facebook page. To be honest with you, I've been a bit dead on socials, but probably Instagram is the best thing. Um my Facebook, I hardly even look at it anymore. So I'll probably just say, yeah, that handle, Graham underscore Morris. Yeah. Easy done. So thanks for joining me today, Graham. It's been awesome to get a, a good insight into rugby league and, and better understand you. And thanks for all the answers. And yeah, I know that coaches and athletes are going to get a lot from this episode. Awesome, man. No problem. Thank you. Thanks for tuning into another episode of Elite Rugby SNC podcast. Remember to like, subscribe, and rate Elite Rugby SNC on Spotify and YouTube. And make sure you follow us on Instagram. Sign up to come a beast via the link in the description or via Instagram page. Also, don't wait, make that good decision and join Elite Rugby SC today and take your game to the next level.